let's say we, we, we have a cancer patient and, and we, we look at their tumor and we find that there are some immune cells that are finding their way into the tumor and are, are sort of successfully attacking the cancer. Uh, we can now uh, sequence the, 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 the genome of those immune cells. So we, can, we, can, we, we actually can learn what is it that they are, they are targeting. Like, so, so, so immune cell, like a B cell, each, each of them makes, makes like a different antibody, essentially, that binds to different things and that, that is genetically encoded. So we can read that out. So we can read out what antibody is an immune cell, a B cell, making itself its way into a tumor, tumor make, making. Uh, we can immediately take that sequence and turn it into mRNA and put it back into that patient to amplify that response. Welcome to the Curiosity Podcast, where we go deep on a wide variety of technical topics with the smartest leaders in the world. I'm Imad Akun, the co-founder and CEO of Mercury. And I'm Raj Suri. I'm the co-founder of uh, Lima, Presto and Lyft. And today we're talking to Hanu, who is the founder and CEO, I believe, of Elix Nano. And um, he is a kind of a biotech savant. Um, you know, Elix Nano is focused on mRNA, and this guy seems to know everything there is to know about mRNA. And you know, it, it's past, it's present, it's future. And he's working on some really interesting applications of this groundbreaking technology. Imad, what, what are you interested to talk to uh, Anu about? Yeah, Hanu is super thoughtful. I think the interesting thing about Helix Nano is like, they're not just thinking about one application of mRNA, they're really thinking about it as a platform. So he's really, you know, gone deep and trying to think about, you know, how can you apply this to lab grown meat and cancers and, you know, how did the COVID-19 vaccines work? So he's just got like this broad kind of uh, set of thinking around it. And he can also tie it back to how will this affect like kind of our lives and uh, the social aspect, which I think makes it like not just like biology, but like really brings it to life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's also a science fiction writer and, um, you know, he actually thinks about like how biotech can affect our lives. And, uh, you know, he had some really interesting comments on like bioweapons and things like that, which I never thought about before. So really fascinating conversation and um, and also just learned a lot about the science. I mean, the thing is with mRNA, I thought was we all kind of like, oh, yeah, this technology came out to deliver the COVID vaccine, but we've all kind of moved on with our lives. But the technology yeah. just gets better and better. And like, there's going to be a lot more impact because of this technology. And he makes a great case for that. Yeah, it really actually made me think about the hype cycle of things, right? Like there was this crazy mRNA hype cycle, but actually it's from 1978. And, you know, these companies are already like decades old. Uh, and actually the next time something happens, like, uh, you know, maybe breast cancer is cured or, or they have, we have a preventative vaccine for it. everyone will be like, oh, of course, mRNA. And then there'll be another hype cycle about it. But you know, it's great that people are like continuously working on this in the background. And we we get to be the uh, yeah, benefactors every 10 years or so of these breakthroughs. Yeah, I mean, it's really compelling when he calls like, mRNA uh, the transistor of like biology, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah, th these guys have raised 60 million, right? So he's obviously yeah. a great storyteller uh, mm -hmm. on like how the company can be hugely impactful. Absolutely. With that, well, let's welcome Anu. Welcome, Anu. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, we wanted to kick off with how did you go from mathematics to building our mRNA biotech company? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think um, it's maybe useful to to start uh, by explaining how why I got into mathematics or, or mathematical physics. Um, and that really, I think, has a lot to do with growing up uh, in a small town in the north of Finland, where winters are cold and long and very dark, but that does mean that uh, when you walk home from school, you, you see a spectacular night sky full of stars. Um, so um, I became an early uh, space and sci-fi enthusiast. Uh, I, I really, really wanted to, to explore the universe and build spaceships. And that led me to study physics. And, and really what uh, then pulled me fully in was this mystery uh, of why does mathematics actually describe reality? So, so all our uh, models of physics are, are really mathematical theories where often some very abstract branch of mathematics that has been developed completely independently 
turns out to be relevant for describing reality, like differential geometry for, for general relativity, so gravitation, or, or, or theory of Hilbert spaces, or group theory for, for quantum mechanics. And uh, so I fell in love with that mystery, still, I think, remains, remains a very deep mystery about the universe. Um, and, uh, and I ended up doing a PhD in string theory, which is, of course, an attempt to, to um, build a unified theory uh, of all fundamental forces, including gravity, which, which is something we have been unable to do so far. And there's, there's other attempts to do, do that, too. And there's sort of experimental window for string theory is sort of, sort of closing, closing uh, pretty rapidly. But it's, a, but it's a beautiful theory and kind of unifies a lot of lot of uh, beautiful ideas. It also doesn't didn't immediately lead to building faster than light uh, spaceships. So so I got a little frustrated with it, and um, uh, and I uh, together with another similarly uh, disillusioned string theorist, uh, Sam Halliday, uh, we started a, a previous company uh, which um, was essentially a, a consultancy solving problems in mathematics for industry. So applied mathematics company, and we built a team of about ten PhDs. Um, mathematicians, theoretical physicists to, to work with us and, and then um, engage with all kinds of uh, clients, typically with some sort of hard engineering problem, uh, ranging from uh, thermal modeling for satellites for European Space Agency to reservoir modeling for, for oil and gas, video compression algorithms for do drones for aerospace and defense, uh, and kind of more uh, speculative work around uh, social network analysis, early explainable AI work, even quantum computing. Uh, for the uh, for the UK uh, Ministry of Defence and actually also life sciences. So so we did we did we did uh, do some work on optimizing, uh, uh, funnily enough, uh, uh, delivery delivery of drugs into so called Langerhans cells under the skin, which which actually have a lot of a lot of relevance to vaccines, which which uh, I obviously ended up working on working on later. But uh, the um, uh, but but sort of the the biology was sort of sort of uh, a theme in the sense that. It represents these complex systems that that we don't really have the tools to understand well in the same way that that we have very um, fundamental mathematical theories in physics. So, so that that already had some pull, uh, and and there there is this history or tradition almost of uh, people coming from physics and mathematics going into uh, into biology. Uh, there, there's uh, the the RNA tie club, which was this uh, group of uh, scientists in the '60s who really solved the, the genetic code, essentially. Like, what is the code for the instructions that RNA uh, in the cell uh, provides uh, to the cell, the cell to make proteins? That club included a lot of physicists who had been also involved in the Manhattan Project, like, like Leo Szilard and George Gamow, a famous cosmologist. So, so there is like a um, uh, precedent for, for being naturally inclined to go from physics to biology. Um, but for me, actually, the reasons were also, also quite personal. So that consultancy business um, uh, ended up uh, uh, sort of not, not working out really well. I think the, the issue, issue that uh, we came up against was um, not having a lot of confidence in our, ourselves with Sam as, as uh, business leaders coming straight from academia. So we brought on board an external CEO, uh, and that person was quite effective, but also insisted on bringing their life partner on board as a board director uh, with a big equity stake. Uh, and they essentially uh, took over took over the company, or we 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 sort of got involved in a in a, uh, a conflict over over the direction of the company. It became very became a very toxic environment. I still hate checking email because uh, I, I have email apnea, so I get shortness of breath from from uh, <laughs> from checking email, uh, and that sort of dates back to to that. That period. So, uh, in the end, we basically walked away from the company, um, and uh, and I, um, I I then started to think about what to what to do next. And um, uh, and my mom had just been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, so she had had a uh, uh, primary breast tumor uh, eleven years previously, and that had been had been operated um, or resected. Uh, but then, then it came came back uh, and metastasized to to her, to her bones, and um, uh, that obviously. Uh, was was quite a uh, dark, dark, dark time and a dark, dark moment, and and you know she 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 eventually did not did not make it, uh, but it um, did make me reflect deeply on the nature on the nature of biology. And then as I sort of looked more more into cutting edge cancer therapies, um, it also became clear that there was this ongoing explosion uh, of capabilities in both reading and writing DNA, uh, where 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 you sort of had these. Moore's law-like curves, sometimes called Carlson curves, after Rob Carlson, who, who, who sort of first plotted and analyzed them, of um, uh, exponential reductions in the cost of um, the reading, reading a base pair of DNA or, or, or writing a base pair of DNA. So, so it really felt very clear 
that if you project these trends forward, uh, something really incredible is going to happen and, and, and it's going to fundamentally change not only medicine, but really like what being human actually actually means. Um, and, uh, and then there were some other early signals that, that sort of showed glimpses of what that, that future might be. I actually I spent time, time in, in Silicon Valley first, first in a place called Singularity University and through there met uh, this uh, Israeli scientist called Ida Bachelet. Um, who had built um, little DNA nanorobots. So, 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 so DNA can actually be used not only as a recipe for making proteins, but for as a construction material. Uh, so there's this whole field called DNA origami, uh, uh, where, where DNA structures are, are sort of folded into, into different geometric shapes, uh, and they can be then assembled to do functional things. So, so Edo had built uh, little nanorobots, like, like these, these very simple mechanical devices out of out of DNA origami. So like boxes that can contain drugs that open when they encounter a certain kind of molecule. Uh, and this just blew my mind. I mean, and, and that that whole technological direction has not really panned out uh, yet, at least as, as a useful, useful set of tools, but but just as a demonstration of what was possible, that's just to me uh, indicated that the future was going to be spectacularly weird. That the kind of almost like Dr Eric Drexler style style nanotechnology uh, was actually closer than than uh, I had imagined, and it, it was really biology. So so I decided to to fully jump fully jump into biology. It had that sort of uh, same feel uh, that I had gotten from this this deep connection between mathematics and physics. That there was this um, whole new universe that 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 sort of had had evolved uh, uh, through through billions of years, full of wonder and complexity, and and and, and something that we were now learning to to talk to and 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 uh, find tools from and, and repurpose. I guess like, you know, one thing beautiful about physics is that it can be like modeled with mathematics and yeah, the the mapping seems fairly strong. Whereas like, at least my impression of biology is that it's way messier and there isn't clear like, I don't know, mathematical modeling or even like very determinism. I guess I'd love your opinion on that. Like is, is mathematics like a good way of modeling biology and uh, at least at the micro level you guys do? So I think, uh, that's a very, very deep, deep question. I think, um, there will undoubtedly be, uh, mathematical principles that will be applicable to biology. Um, I think our expectations should be different though, than, than from physics, because we are talking about these, these complex emergent phenomena. We will eventually, I think, uh, maybe with the help of AI, uh, understand the, those those principles of emergence uh, and uh, and how how these complex structures emerge from simpler simpler structures uh, and how they how they evolve. There is some interesting work already in that direction. Call uh, for example, I think my my kind of favorite favorite example is there's a, there's an MIT scientist called um, Jeremy England uh, who um, has been working on non equilibrium thermodynamics to to try to uh, build essentially toy models of of life. And, and he has noticed, for example, that, that uh, quite a lot of this uh, uh, emergence of, of biological structures like, like cells, etc., can actually be uh, explained if you, if you define this uh, quantity uh, of uh, dissipation, like maximizing, maximizing how much energy that system dissipates. And, and actually self-replication emerges very naturally from that. So he, he primarily works with very, very simplified Models of, of life, life like systems and biological molecules, but uh, but I think fundamentally it is it is going to be possible. Now now there's also some very clear, not not necessarily mathematical, but there are also like clear organizing principles that exist in biology. Uh, and and one really important one is that that biology is an informational field. Like it, it, cells are information processing systems, and and like our immune system, for example, is is, is an information processing system. So we can look at and manipulate the information flow uh, in that system. And, and we can also intervene in it without necessarily fully understanding it. We can at least uh, poke at it and, and perturb it. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think, where we'll uh, get more into, into to RNA. But I think that's where the power of mRNA lies, actually, that it is the, the natural layer where, where to, to uh, intervene in that information flow. Yeah, I just want to uh, just uh, double click on what you just said. I mean, as these cells and or like you know these molecules being information processing systems is it possible to write really good simulations um of how all these different systems interact and and be able to predict accurately how you know these different uh you know systems will act in different situations um so not not so far i mean i think the um 
complexity of an individual cell is, is really quite, quite staggering. I mean, you have, uh, you know, 20,000, many, many thousands of different kinds of proteins, each of which is like a complex nanomachine in its own, own right, sort of uh, uh, with, with millions of copies of them all crowded together in this, this uh, bioreactor mess, which then obviously interacts with its, with its environment and other cells, cells constantly as well. So some progress is being made. There's this nice, nice quote from, from uh, Demis Hassabis uh, from DeepMind that um, around um, sort of drawing a parallel between basically physics and mathematics and then biology and AI. I think machine learning does provide us with um, a natural way of approximating very complex nonlinear systems if we can generate a lot, 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 of, lot of data about them. And I think I'm sort of, um, I'll, I'll need to check the exact reference, but I think the most impressive thing in the kind of whole cell simulation direction I've seen is a uh, deep learning model of single yeast cell that does seem to be able to, to at least to some extent, predict gene expression patterns uh, in, in an individual. What's the gap then, I mean, for these simulations? It's, I mean, it's obviously complex, but, um, you know, we have amazing computing power at this point. Is it that we, we don't have an accurate um, model for how these things react? Because it does surprise me at this, you know, at this stage where we're able to do things like LLMs, like we can predict biological uh, interactions as well. Yeah, so so there's certainly been like amazing advances in terms of uh, protein structure modeling with alpha fold, alpha fold and now, now also like LLMs, transformers applied to applied to, to protein sequences. Uh, but I think the dynamics is still very challenging. So so proteins, so, so we, can, we can kind of predict the static 3D shape of a protein, but then actually the sort of uh, how, how it changes dynamically, even for an individual protein, uh, is, is very, very challenging. It might be that we need quantum computers. It is ultimately a quantum mechanical problem. What is the sort of um, landscape of dynamics of, of a protein molecule or, 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 or uh, another kind of biological molecule look like? Um, and that's where I think we run up against the limits of classical classical simulation of quantum systems come, becomes exponentially hard with, with size. So I, I guess like to, to flip it around, um, the system itself simulates itself. Uh, and, and I think we, rather than rather than sort of trying to to necessarily fully build um, simulations of, uh, uh, of of cells or or, or uh, other other biological systems, um, I think we just should also just develop uh, better ways of interrogating them. So getting 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 data from the actual systems themselves. I do, I do want to also also say a bit more about that because because this is actually why drug discovery is so hard or has traditionally been, been so hard. If you look at the, the cost and uh, failure rate of drug development, it's like, uh, uh, so for cancer drugs from the sort of first phase one, phase safety, first safety study to approval, uh, the, the success rate is 5%, and then and, and, and it costs a billion dollars uh, or, or mm -hmm. of that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, so, so clearly we're, we're doing something wrong. And, and, uh, and I think one of the fundamental things we are doing wrong is that uh, we don't have very good predictive models. In, in cancer, like the most successful therapies are the ones that um, uh, engage the immune system to, to, to go after cancer. Mouse immune systems and human immune systems are not, not the same. Uh, there are sort of tumor organoid models where you take part of the patient's tumor and then cult culture it with, with like human human immune cells, but but then you don't have a functional immune system that actually actually develops and, and learns learns a, a new response. And I think like computationally, we have also not at all yet bridged that gap because of all the, the sort of scaling scaling issues issues we, we just talked about. I mean, it's it's not to 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 predict like an immunotherapy efficacy. It's not that you need to to model one cell, which is we, 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 which we cannot do, but you, you need to model uh, a, a system of billions of interacting immune cells that, that, uh, that, that uh, and you know, pathways between them and, and, uh, and, and then the cancer itself, uh, where, 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 where you, know, you, you, you have something as complex as, uh, it, 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 cancer is our own cells, so, so it has sort of, sort of that, that full genetic complexity that we have. So, so I think uh, there, there's some humility there that I think we, we, we need to, to, to have around like how much can we simulate. Mm -hmm. but, yep. but the system itself simulates. So, so I think if we can gather more data from the system, which we now can with both uh, high-throughput DNA sequencing and other, other kind of uh, new uh, high-throughput assays, uh, we can generate large data sets that, that we can exploit. And then uh, if there's a natural way to, to perturb the system, uh, like with mRNA, I think we can, can close the loop. And then, then, then sort of the, the Demis Hassabi's point, given the feedback loop, we can then, then sort of have, have a, 
um, uh, design models. AI design yeah. layer that sort of help, yeah. helps us actually actually sort of steer the system in the right right direction. So so it might be also more like a real time control problem rather than rather than fully fully sort of modeling modeling system. So using the outputs of the system, using the information we get to train the inputs or, or understand the, you know the system better, understand that black box, which is similar similar to AI, yeah. But to make, to make that make that sort of not abstract. Like uh, mm -hmm. he, here's something here is something that that mRNA makes possible now. This hasn't really been done, but but it, it is it, it's possible. Or a version of this maybe maybe is, is happening. But um, let's say we 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 have a cancer patient and and we we look at their tumor, and we find that there are some immune cells that are finding their way into the tumor, and are are sort of successfully attacking the cancer. Uh, we can now. Uh, sequence the, the 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 genome of those immune cells, so we can we can we we actually can learn what is it that they are they are targeting. Like so 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 immune cell like a B cell, each each of them makes makes like a different antibody essentially that binds to different things, and that that is genetically encoded. So we can read that out. So we can read out what antibody is an immune cell a B cell making itself its way into a tumor tumor making. Uh, we can immediately take that sequence and turn it into mRNA and put it back into that patient to amplify that response. The immune system has already figured out what is the right kind of response. It's maybe just not powerful enough. So you can amplify that. And, and then you can also put that into, into another patient. The, another, another version version of this is, which is, which is sort of more clinically uh, Later, later stage now is the idea of personalized vaccines. And then this is actually, this, this may have, have some, some Fundamental problems uh, as as an approach, but like uh, what, what what is clinically being done done now, not not yet approved uh, as as a, as a therapy, but um, uh, you know uh, companies like companies like Moderna and BioNTech are are taking individual patients' tumors, uh, sequencing them, and identifying uh, mutations that are unique to 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 those cancer cells, and then making vaccines in an attempt to target those those mutations. These haven't yet moved sort of the clinical needle needle massively. Um, because often it is, it is, it is actually uh, one problem with cancer cells is that they are our own own cells, so it's hard to generate immune responses against them. Uh, and also, like it, specific individual mutations, cancers can usually usually evolve around. These kinds of feedback loops are now now possible in the case of like these personalized so-called neoantigen vaccines. There is already a machine learning step in the process of deploying these therapies. Um, uh, machine learning models are being used to predict like which ones of these mutations might actually be visible to the immune system and sort of displayed on the surface surface of the, the cancer cell so that the immune system mm -hmm. can attack mm -hmm. them. So maybe this is a good point to talk about what does Helix Nano do? Like, what, you know, uh, how long have you been working on it, and what was the what was the idea and the evolution, and what does it do now? Yeah. So so the so basically the earlier our origin story really came came directly from my. Excitement, uh, excitement around biology. I, uh, I sort of wanted to 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 find some key critical problem to solve solve in biology. And uh, actually, the original idea uh, had had around had, had to do with um, uh, being able to record uh, what happened inside an individual cell and using DNA as sort of a st information storage storage for that. So, so kind of a crazy idea. Uh, now, now actually, quite a lot of lot of work work in that area. But that. Um, um, was a good enough idea for a business plan competition around uh, uh, 2015, which was uh, the business plan competition was organized by by Johnson and Johnson, and um, the, the winners basically uh, were given uh, J and J support and also lab space uh, at their um, at the J and J campus in Belgium, Janssen Janssen Pharmaceutica. Uh, so I ended up ended up spending a year uh, at at Janssen. Uh, and, and so working working on this idea with with a couple of scientists, but also also just sort of talking to everyone involved in the drug discovery process. So that was that was a big part of my my biology education of, of just trying to to understand uh, understand what what was happening and and trying to identify where where some of the critical uh, bottlenecks there were. And what very quickly emerged was that like sure enough, it is now possible to to print genes and and make make synthetic DNA and and design. Design DNA DNA constructs, but uh, how do you actually get them to do something useful in the body? Getting getting them to actually then work in the body was 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 sort of a big big challenge. And um, uh, and I made a uh, connection with the Dresden uh, University scientist who who had come from George Church's lab at, at Harvard Medical School. Um, so George Church, of course, is is the the sort of 
titanic figures in, in the field of synthetic biology, whose lab has, has uh, invented both uh, key, key DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis technologies, very early, of course, very early involved in, in CRISPR and, and uh, you know, many, many other things now also operating very much in this sort of biology AI, AI intersection. Um, and um, so, so, um, so the Dresden scientist introduced me to, to Nikolai Eroshenko, who's now, now uh, my co-founder and, and the CSO of, of Helix Nano. And uh, uh, so together, together with George and uh, Sri Kusuri, uh, Nikolai co-invented uh, essentially some of the core modern high throughput DNA synthesis technologies, how to, how to use inkjet printers to, to make smaller, smaller uh, uh, strands of DNA that could then be stitched together for, for, for actual, actual genes. So his work went into a company called Gen9 that Ginkgo Bioworks bought. And then, then um, Nikolai stayed on at the church lab to try to figure out how to engineer the next generation CRISPR-like CRISPR -like systems, but also came up against this, this problem of um, how to, how to deliver them, how to, how to get them to, in, into, into the body. And that's, that's where we sort of found, found a meeting, meeting of minds and, and, and concluded that, um, okay, there, there's sort of a finite, finite space of solutions. It's maybe like worth just unpacking a little bit of like what happens in a cell, like, like what, what, is, what is the information flow, flow that we talked about. And, and, uh, and it's really the, the uh, you know, our DNA, our genome, uh, is where the information is sort of more permanently stored. So, so it's the recipe book for all the proteins. Uh, proteins, proteins really do everything, but the, the recipes for the proteins are stored in DNA. And when a, when a cell needs to make a protein, um, it makes a temporary copy of the, the recipe from the DNA uh, into, into mRNA. So, so it's like DNA is the ROM and, and RNA is the RAM. The, the program gets loaded, loaded into, into memory. Uh, and RNA is sort of less permanent chemically. It's more transient. It's less stable chemically than, than DNA. And that's why it is on purpose. The cell doesn't want to make every single protein, protein uh, permanently all the time, but only when it needs them. And then the RNA uh, carries the information to the protein factories of the cell, the, the sort of molecular machines that actually then make proteins. And they're, they're called ribosomes. And they are actually very much like 3D printers. They read through the, the mRNA and then one amino acid by amino acid, the building block, blocks of the proteins, uh, they, they, they assemble the protein and then the protein folds into, into its final 3D shape or, or can also be dyna a dynamic shape that then, then, and then goes and carries, carries out its function, whether it's construction material or signaling or, or enzyme or, or, or something else. But that is the information flow. So, so DNA, RNA, protein. That's called the central dogma of, of molecular biology. And this RNA is called mRNA, right? So the, 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 there's other kinds, of, other kinds of RNAs, but the, 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 uh, the type of RNA that carries the information to make protein is called messenger, messenger RNA, so, or, or, or mRNA, mRNA. We were initially more interested in DNA. Uh, and and so, so could we just like get synthetic DNA more efficiently into the cells, cells more directly. Um, and that's why the company is called Helix Nano. The, the Helix, Helix, Helix is, is, is uh, the, the DNA Helix. No, uh, and um, the, the um, so um, one way to get DNA into, the cell, into cells, uh, which is used a lot with gene therapy, is with viruses. So you, so you make a synthetic virus uh, and, um, uh, and you, load the D, you load the DNA in and, and then the, you infect infect the, the patient with, with the virus. Uh, and it's a non-replicating virus. So, so it's only, you've, you've removed all the parts that, that help it replicate. So, so you're just sort of leveraging the uh, parts of the virus that help, help the um, vir virus get, get into the cells. Um, and, and this kind of works like this, this is, there's a the class of viruses called AAVs or adeno-associated viruses. And there's many, many, many gene therapies in clinical development uh, and uh, around using, using that technology. But uh, we sort of discarded that approach pretty much immediately because um, it has fundamental limitations. First one is um, you get an immune response because you're putting the, 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 the DNA into uh, a viral vehicle, uh, a virus, uh, your immune system, once it's been exposed to that virus once, uh, recognizes it, and and uh, and now you can't treat the patient again. So 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 what what ha happens happens here is that the virus doesn't necessarily integrate the DNA permanently into your genome. It just puts like an extra bit of DNA into into the nucleus that sort of floats alongside your your own own genome, and, and then RNA gets made and protein gets made from it. So it does does work, but but it, that can also then get flushed out eventually. And then you can't redose because because now you have an immune response uh, against against the virus. Um, incidentally, this is kind of an issue also with uh, some of the viral vector uh, vaccines that were used in COVID vaccines, like the the adenoviral 
antiviral vaccines like like J and J and AstraZeneca. But, and then the, the other problem is that um, viruses have a limited DNA payload capacity, so you can only put in so much so much DNA, and it's quite it's quite it's quite small. So so we we thought viruses were out. We wanted to to we wanted to go full synthetic, and and uh, so we we. We, we found a way to make these minimal DNA vectors, like basically just take synthetic DNA generated using some of these technologies that the Nikolai invented, uh, put little loops at the end to make it more stable uh, so that it doesn't, doesn't unravel. Um, and then the question is, okay, how do, how, do you, how, do, how do you get it into the cell? And then more importantly, how do you get it into the nucleus in the cell where, where, where DNA needs to be uh, to, to work? And... Um, uh, and we realized actually that uh, there was a way to to solve that nuclear nuclear import problem. So there's 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 various proteins that um, have signals that tell the cell to get them into the nucleus, uh, because there are proteins that need to need to go to the nucleus to do stuff like unwind DNA or 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 or, or make make mRNA. Um, so we thought we would piggyback on that that pathway. So we we designed a protein. That had a had a portion that grabbed the DNA, and then another portion that told the cell to take this this whole thing uh, into the nucleus, uh, and that actually worked. It, it enhanced enhanced our ability to get DNA DNA into the nucleus. But then the problem was we didn't want to actually separately make that protein, because that, this is sort of again like like one of these assumptions that I've maybe had here in the background that's useful to unpack. Making proteins is hard. Like like uh, so so the the first first biotech revolution uh, going back to the late 70s and, and, and Genentech and so on, um, the, the realization was that you can take a human gene and put it into other organisms and, and have other organisms make human proteins. Uh, so insulin or, 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 or other, other biologic drugs. But the problem is that every protein is different. So, so, to, do, I mean, so, so to do go through that process, you, you'll, you'll basically say, have to go think, okay, like in what kind of cell line uh, should I do this? Like, uh, uh, I, I, you know, is the Chinese hamster ovarian cells? Is it yeast? Is it some other, other cell type? Where, where can I actually make this, this protein? Or what cell, cell type can make this protein for me? Um, and then the question is, okay, now, now, now it's sort of working. Uh, can I purify the protein? Can I can I can I isolate enough of it to with high enough quality? Does it sort of does it clump? Does it does it do something weird that I need to deal with? And now it's six months later, and you still haven't made your made your protein. And then you know obviously to scale that, that's a billion dollar exercise. Also, we did not want to do that. I mean that's that's kind of one of the, the cool coolest things to keep in mind about like working with DNA and RNA. That that it, this is about turning your own cells into these protein factories and having them do what they do naturally to to to, to make these proteins right there. Where they needed. Um, anyway, so 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 the, to go back to our sort of two stage two stage rocket system for getting getting DNA uh, into the nucleus. We then realized that okay, like uh, RNA doesn't need to get into the nucleus. RNA just needs to get get into the cell. So what if we have RNA make our helper protein, uh, and we put both DNA and RNA in simultaneously, and that that sort of helps helps get the DNA into into the nucleus, and that also worked. Uh, but then Looking at our controls, where we just used the RNA, the expression levels were so high that it actually felt like we didn't need the DNA at all. And then that's kind of going going back to this information flow flow in the cell. The the RNA layer is special, so so it's it's like um, uh, so RNA is not permanent, un, uh, unlike unlike DNA. Uh, it it has the same design freedom, so so you can you can have the cell make any uh, protein you want, not just any, not just any human protein. Like this is one of those sort of also uh, galaxy brain moments. Our cells can make any protein that can exist if given the right information. So, so it's not, the, not just the 20,000 human proteins, but it's the, I don't know what the number is, like 10 to the power of 1300 or some, something like absurdly ridiculous number of like, what is the, what is the number of possible, possible proteins? Our cells can make all of them if, if they're given the recipe. And the, and the RNA is the most direct way to to give them give them that recipe. So from that point on, we 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 were and this was like uh, late 2017, early 2018. We 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 were full in on mRNA. It became like a very defining belief for for Helix Nano that uh, mRNA was going to be the transistor of biotech. It was going to be the the layer on which everything else would get built. This would be the the place where we we actually 
interface with 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 human biology. Um, so 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 long long ori origin story, but but that's kind of kind of uh, how we how we how we ended up uh, with mRNA. And then the next question was, okay, like if mRNA is the thing, um, why aren't we there already? Like what what are the fundamental problems in the field? Uh, what what sort of um, uh, has prevented mRNA from from taking off? Given that this is this is sort of a fairly obvious obvious observation that this is the right right layer. Uh, and actually, um, historically, the first experiments with, with uh, sort of synthetic mRNA expressing a protein in human cells go back to 1978. So, so this is not a this is not a new idea. Uh, but it did take a long time for the field to 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 take off because um, the the problem is that. Um, if we're trying to do this manly the middle attack on the cell by putting in mRNA from the outside, this is also what viruses do. So, so uh, vi viruses try to play exactly the same trick to hi hijack our uh, protein making factories to make more copies of themselves. So, um, so the cells themselves, uh, not just sort of our, our adaptive immune system, but actually our cells themselves have ancient sensors that have evolved to detect RNA that looks viral. Uh, if we make M mRNA the same way the cell cell makes it outside outside the body and put it in um, uh, above a certain dose or or a certain dosing frequency, these sensors inside the cell, these alarm bells uh, warning the cell that it's it's been infected, are going to be triggered. Um, and then what the cell does um, if it thinks it's been uh, and it, it, I, I say thinks. I mean, obviously there's some information processing going going on here, but but the 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 um, the cell shuts down. It's protein factories. Uh, it doesn't want to make make more virus, and, but that also means that your mRNA payload does not does not get made. Uh, and then, furthermore, uh, it alerts all the nearby cells. It sends out inflammatory signals to to all the, all the nearby nearby cells, um, and um, uh, and and then that that effect can also become systemic. So so if you had a COVID mRNA vaccine, uh, some of the local side effects, some of the local inflammation, actually actually can come from come from this this effect. So um, the reason we have COVID vaccines, the reason reason the, the mRNA field exists, is is basically uh, Katalin Kariko and Andrew Wiseman, who just got the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this. The really interesting observation that Kariko made was that why does our own mRNA not trigger these antiviral sensors? If our cell is making mRNA all the time, why doesn't that mRNA set off uh, all the same alarms? Like how, how can our cells even possibly work? So uh, what she realized was that um, after the cell makes mRNA, um, it adds various chemical decorations to it to, to mark it as self, uh, as, as something, something that is actually, actually us. And, um, and she found a way to, to duplicate those chemical modifications synthetically um, and, uh, and to make mRNA that was actually chemically modified uh, in a way that made it, made it look less like a virus and more like our, our, our own, own, own RNA. When, when did she discover that? Uh, this was 2015. What is that method called? So chemically modified nucleotides. The the so RNA, RNA like like um, like DNA uh, is made out of these four base pairs or four letters. Uh, so DNA is A C G and T. Uh, RNA is A C G and U. Um, and uh, the specific modification that she initially discovered with Weizmann. Uh, it was called pseudouridine. So you so you take the U and you add a chemical group to it to make it make it look slightly slightly different. Um, and um, uh, that was kind of the the um, firing shot really for for the field. Interesting. Did didn't Moderna start before two thousand fifteen though, or is that around when it started? Uh, so so I think there's there's a pretty direct line from from this discovery. Maybe I'm thinking the key publication was twenty fifteen, but but the, the 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 work work was out there there, there earlier. Um, but the, um, the, what, what happened uh, was there was another scientist uh, called Derek Rossi, uh, whose lab was working on uh, stem cells. So he was trying to figure out how to, um, uh, how to turn norm normal cells into, into stem cells to, to make induced pluripotent stem cells. This is, of course, the, the discovery of Shiro Yamanaka, uh, where there are these Yamanaka factors, which are genes that if you turn them on, you can restore, restore cell cells to a stem cell-like like, like state. And um, uh, so Rossi realized that uh, mRNA was a really good way to deliver deliver these these Yamanaka factors, uh, but then he couldn't make it make it work with normal normal mRNA. But when he, when when and I forget now the name of the scientist who 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 did this in his lab, but they they um, 
they, they realized that using these Carico modifications, that actually worked. Um, and then, uh, so Rossi then realized that this, this had a lot of potential, that, the, that, that, that really chemically modified mRNA could transform the stem cell field. Uh, and, I, and I believe you had Bob Langer on, on, on the podcast, podcast recently. Uh, Rossi, then, Rossi then went to Bob Langer to say, there's something, there's something interesting here. Uh, and Langer and Langer realized that no, no, this is much bigger than just stem cells. This can be this can be applied to to anything. Uh, and then uh, Bob went to to Nobar uh to flagship pioneering, and that's how Moderna Moderna got started. Um, but the but the discovery was and the, actually the IP uh, did come from from Carico and Weisman. So the pseudo uridine, which was the original uh, Carico and Weisman discovery, turns out that's less useful if if your mRNA manufacturing quality improves. Um, but there is a derivative of that called n one methylsuridine, which is now the, the gold standard of the wheeled field, which he also discovered. Um, and I think Moderna did discover that independently, but uh, Carico filed filed her her IP IP first. So so both Moderna and BioNTech, uh, uh, the other sort of big mRNA company who collaborated with Pfizer on, on, on the COVID vaccines, um, licensed n one methylsuridine from from uh, UPenn and, and Carico. And there's like um, uh, a story there also around like uh, how Carico was treated by by UPenn. Like she 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 was actually in the process of doing her own startup to to develop mRNA therapeutics, but UPenn decided to take the IP back and then license it to to Moderna and, and, and BioNTech. So so there's uh, but I think she's somewhat redeemed now by by the the Nobel Nobel Prize. But uh, that's sort of the um, that is kind of the origin story of the the modern modern version of the uh, of, of the mRNA field. Um, so, so it is. It is really all about a um, long way to to get to to what what Helix Nano has been doing. So, so we um, this we kind of also also realized um, that um, even though N1 methylsuridine enables uh, higher doses and more frequent doses than unmodified mRNA, sort of sort of natural looking looking mRNA, it's still not perfect. So, so you if if you um, Exceed a certain dose threshold, even with n one modified mRNA, uh, or, or or certain dosing frequency, you still trigger these antiviral sensors. That fact uh, you can you can see uh, more or less directly from the pipelines of Moderna and BioNTech. So so they 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 are kind of focused on mRNA applications where um, you don't need to dose that frequently, uh, or, or 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 the individual doses don't have to be have to be that high. So that includes. Uh, Various types of vaccines. It includes like single dose uh, immunotherapies. Uh, it includes like some very low, low dose requiring enzyme replacement therapies for rare genetic diseases. Um, so the limitations of technology are so, sort of sort of built in uh, to the kinds of kinds of things things they're doing. So, so one of the core core ideas behind Helix Nano is we we are are sort of uh, constantly pushing the envelope of what is possible with mRNA. We want to to turn mRNA into this. Almost like an external genome, like an ex exogenome for 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 us to to store outside the body and incorporate into our bodies when when whenever it's needed. Uh, and one and big part of that is um, making the larger and larger and more frequent mRNA doses possible. Uh, so so one one core breakthrough we made uh, is uh, a novel chemistry that that is sort of analogous to to the the Carico discovery. But actually, modifying uh, two two of the mRNA letters simultaneously, specifically C and U, simultaneously, and we're finding that that lets us uh, go uh, uh, at least nine times higher uh, than than was possible with with animal methyl pseudouridine, uh, sort of, and to expand the, the space of possible mRNA applications. So that includes things like ultra ultra potent vaccines, uh, but but also um, turning turning potent biologic drugs into 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 mRNA. Are you actually kind of building your own vaccines and other things? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. You're not like yes. selling this kind of IP slash methodology. This is sort of again. This is like a transistor level mRNA technology. It is so broadly applicable that um, we we are not going to uh, be able to capture all the value ourselves. Nor nor should we. Um, but so so we are we are also. Um, uh, currently, uh, in in a number of collaborations, where where we will license that technology to others for other other applications that we're pursuing ourselves, but we are certainly certainly building our own own vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, and I guess like uh, the where we are where we are aiming to go um, is and and the, the the massive opportunity we see right now, which is sort of uniquely possible with 
with mRNA um, has to do with uh, closing that loop that we talked about, going, going from DNA sequence, information that we can read from DNA to, to a drug or, or, or a therapeutic. And uh, one setting where we think this is going to be incredibly powerful is uh, preventative cancer vaccines. So, or, or like a very, very early stage treatment, treatment cancer vaccines, but effectively preventative cancer vaccines. Uh, because the, the, the other set of technologies that has been advancing incredibly rapidly on the back of DNA sequencing uh, that has followed these Moore's law-like curves, you know, like going from uh, hundreds of millions per human genome to $100 per, per human genome in the space of 20 years. Um, it, it, so so one, one, one area leveraging that is our, our liquid biopsies. So what that, what that means is we give out a blood sample um, and little bits of DNA uh, in, in that blood sample uh, can be uh, amplified and sequenced to um, detect any signs of early development of cancer. So, so, so precancerous cells and cancer cells in your body are shedding these DNA sequences into your bloodstream. And we now have the technology to detect them and then, then predict uh, whether, whether you might be developing cancer or not. Um, and then, you know, there are companies like Grail, uh, uh, Garden, Garden, many, many others who are, uh, uh, Freenome, who are working on this. Um, but uh, what's actually missing is an intervention. Because, because I mean, let's say, you know, uh, the, the, the assay readout says you have X percent chance of, of developing uh, uh, pancreatic cancer or, or, or colorectal cancer in like the next five years. You're not going to go on radiation or chemo at that point. You might not have any detectable tumors, but, but you have cancerous or precancerous cells in your body. And your immune system theoretically knows how to, to, to deal with them. It just needs a little bit of uh, information. And in the form of mRNA vaccines, we now have a way of, of giving, giving that to you. But to really enable that, we do need more potent mRNA vaccines that have been uh, possible, possible in the past. And that's, that's really where we, that we want to make it work. It would have to be personalized per individual, or there will be like classes of vaccines you can develop uh, they would uh, very likely to be classes. So, so there would be so so there would be some common patterns that that would would recur. In, in fact, that's kind of borne out by by some some studies that are coming out. Um, so there are like common pathways that get um, uh, get get uh, activated in in early early cancer development uh, that are broader that you could uh, you could target. So it might not have to be like uniquely personalized, but you could have sort of a library of things that you you mix and match for given individual. Where's the furthest along we are today in, in, um, in the state of that technology for developing a, a sort of a cancer vaccine? So, uh, so there are uh, a lot of therapeutic cancer vaccines in development um, and, and uh, all, both, both mRNA cancer vaccines and others where, where you are sort of trying to essentially um, amplify a cancer patient's response uh, against, against, um, uh, against an existing tumor. So those are, those are sort of in, in late stage clinical trials, trials currently. Uh, and there is some promise, like uh, uh, Moderna. Moderna has uh, an, an bio, uh, Moderna has seen a response, sort of uh, at least reducing the rate of recurrence for metastatic melanoma. Uh, BioNTech has seen uh, extended survival in pancreatic cancer, which is really one of the most lethal uh, mm -hmm. lethal cancers. So, so, so there is there is promise there. Um, the um, uh, challenge, though, is still the response rates. So, so the response rates are. Uh, Quite low, so there is there is clearly gaps. What do you mean by response rates? So how many p patients actually have their tumor shrink? So it works, but it only works for a small percentage of people. Correct. What percentage are we uh, talking and this, about? This is a it's highly variable between different cancer types and trials, but it, it is like between ten and fifty, but probably more on the lower lower end. And still in like low small scale, right? Yeah. No, no. These are these are like. Uh, uh, hundreds or or sort of around a thousand patients. Patients, I, mm -hmm. I think, is now the phase three trial that Moderna and Merck are doing. So promising, but there's still some work to do. This is still also the first generation mRNA technologies. So there's there's at least three layers at which these things can be improved. Like like there there's the just the, the amount of vaccine you can deliver. There's the dangerous like how 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 strongly can you engage the immune system with that vaccine, and then what are you sort of targeting the right things things in the cancer. So so uh, I think there's the order of magnitude gains to be made in each of those areas. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you also mentioned on your website that looking at um, targeting climate change, um, how, how is mRNA going to have impact on climate change? One, one area that I, that I think will have, have a big impact on, on climate change is food. Um, so reducing, reducing the carbon footprint of, of food, uh, where, where um, you know, a lot of people are excited about uh, cultured meat. So actually, actually growing 
growing meat in the lab or going meat, growing meat in bioreactors rather than rather than uh, sort of slaughtering animals. The sort of cattle industry obviously has a has a massive uh, both carbon footprint and and uh, uh, land and water use uh, use uh, footprint and so on. But the challenge has been scale. One big issue with with cultured meat is that there are uh, these certain components that um, uh, are are present in the in the serum, like like cow cow serum, when you actually uh, culture cult, culture culture cells uh, that you need to include. Um, that if you're not using any animal products, you then need to make synthetically. So so you actually need to to set up a cell powered biologics factory to make make these components called growth factors to to help help the your your sort of meat cells meat cells grow and that's a very very expensive process like these 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 um um these growth factors are enormously costly uh, to 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 produce uh and to some extent like that'll obviously get cheaper with the scale uh but still that is going to be one of the the main bottlenecks for for scale for for cultured meat um so something we have we have explored and and have uh, have 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 uh, done some experiments with uh, with partners uh, and I have some IP around uh is just using mRNA to encode growth factors so so just to have the the uh cultured meat cells make those growth factors themselves uh and uh and mRNA manufacturing, as we've seen also with COVID vaccines, is extremely scalable and can be made made extremely cheap. Um, so, so that that that's one area where where uh, I, I do I do feel feel like there's there's a lot of lot of potential uh, of of like uh, basically uh, in, in a way like actually very similar even to the um, um, Derry Crossy uh, idea behind behind the Moderna story, like how how to, how to sort of manipulate cells in cell culture and change the cell type and, and get them grow grow faster yeah basically any biological process where you need to kind of manipulate production you know you could use mrna to effectively do yes. that right yes and so you're focusing on these like emerging areas that if you figure something out there then you can you can come out with a product that could uh, really you know help a lot of people that's correct yeah the normal startup advice is focus and do one thing really well it seems like you guys are doing a bunch of different things is there is there something about kind of biotech that like works better with like kind of broad set, set of kind of parallel experiments as they take a long time to get through uh, kind of trials and stuff? I think I think in this case, I, I would say we are we are sort of uh, uh, converging around like ninety eight percent on cancer current currently. Uh, so so there's we we've certainly gone through. Uh, quite a lot of exploration, uh, exploration on the way. It, it is like like if you are an AI or a machine learning company that has built a better foundation model. <laughs> what, what do you what what do you what do you apply it to? I think you you need to do a lot of experiments to figure out where is the biggest uh, unmet need, the highest value problem, and the most impactful problem you can solve. Uh, so so that's kind of the journey journey we've gone through, and and uh, you know I think both in terms of our personal passions and the, and the long term impact. Um, closing this this information loop in oncology is what we really fundamentally want to do. Uh, but there are other areas where we can enable enable others with the technologies that we've, we've built we built on the way. I do agree on the the focus point, but uh, also I think that one one has to switch between the exploration and ex exploitation modes. Like like there there's a place place for both. This is probably like a little bit of a naive question. Uh, you know, I always imagined, especially as a kid, that like we would solve cancer, like there'd be one solution and like all, all cancer would be solved. Uh, is cancer like that or is it always going to be kind of like a whack-a-mole where you'll be like, oh, this type of cancer we can now do, but there's another 10,000 to go? There might be there might be a silver bullet. So there's at least a chance. So so there are there are certain targets in cancer that are fairly universal. Uh, and we are we are exploring exploring some of them. We we are developing uh, a vaccine candidate targeted against against one of them. Uh, so so I think it might be a finite set of things. It might not be not necessarily just one thing, but uh, but there there might be there might be a finite set of things. And then then I think the 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 point is also like at what point do you intervene? I mean I mean I, I think more broadly like immune system is the silver bullet. Like the the immune immune system can cure cancer clearly. I mean it does so every day. Like like we we have. Cancer cells or precancerous cells constantly popping up in, the, in their in our bodies, and and we don't get cancer, uh, all of us, all the time. So, uh, so it is successful at this. Does it fail because it's just a probability game? Like eventually something gets through. It's a probability game, so, and it's it's an evolutionary game. So, so the the, the immune system puts evolutionary pressure on the uh, on on the precancerous cells, uh, and and they, they there's there's a set of steps they go through 
to then then uh, hide from the immune system to to proliferate faster under that under that pressure. So so it, it evolves and, and then uh, eventually eventually it, it sort of reaches the complexity threshold where where it can sort of have this have this runaway runaway velocity where the immune system can't keep up. And at that point, we obviously then need to to help help the immune system. Um, but I, I actually do do think there there is is a uh, finite set of universal targets targets in cancer that will be very powerful. Uh, and hitting those targets is is harder. One challenge there is that um, a lot of these universal cancer targets uh, are also uh, targets that would be present on healthy cells, although although usually in lesser amounts. But the the um, uh, but the immune system ha has also evolved to avoid attacking ourselves. So so that's that is one of the fundamental problems in cancer. Cancer is us, and and uh, the immune system uh, doesn't want to to attack it. There are these mechanisms uh, called called tolerance. Where, where the immune system uh, learns to avoid targets that that um, that are, are are present on sort of normal normal cells, um, and a lot of these universal cancer cell cancer cell targets are are in that that category. Uh, but there are there are ways to to break that, and uh, something we've actually been able to do recently, leveraging some some uh, more, some of the more. But I mean, I think Raj mentioned LLMs actually. Actually, so so we have leveraged some LLM-based protein design tools to to be able to uh, overcome some of these self tolerance effects, and we are now testing that. What does that What does that mean? Like you've got an LLM that's. I guess I don't want to necessarily break it down step by step, but it's just, it's yeah. essentially the, the no, just core. at a high level. Like what's the LLM doing? So the LLM is uh, redesigning uh, the um, vaccine. So 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 it's re uh, we are taking a target um, that is present on a cancer cell and on a, also on a healthy cell. So yeah. if we just use that target by itself as a vaccine, uh, we, we wouldn't generate a very strong immune response. Uh, but uh, there's a way to redesign that target uh, uh, that we then deliver as, as mRNA in such a way that it sort of evades the self-tolerance issue. This is like a fine-tuned LLM that like understands like proteins and all that. So LLMs are actually incredibly good now at, at generating protein designs. So uh, for example, there's this open source meta meta release model called ESM2 that was that was trained with um, 350 million uh, protein sequences. But the remarkable thing there is that actually, even though uh, it was not told anything about the structure of these proteins, it was not given any structural information. Uh, just in the process of compressing that information and, and learning learning how to represent these proteins internally, it actually came up with the representation of structure, uh, and 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 is now outperforming uh, alpha fold uh, like systems in in uh, in being able to uh, to to predict protein structure. Uh, and these kinds of models are also generative. You can essentially specify a set of pro properties that you want for your protein, and you can you can prompt it prompt it with that and have it generate designs for you. So. That's what we are leveraging for for cancer vaccine design. You guys have been around since 2013, is that right? Almost 10 years. So the company was technically technically founded 2013 as an entity. I would say, like in its modern form, we 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 go back to 2016. So that's kind of when I started. I had this uh, uh, Odyssey uh, in, in in the wilderness uh, with a lot of lot of help on the way early on. But then then sort of with Nikolai, we really really uh, converged on the on the, the current form. And how's the business model like? Are you basically like um, it's a technology-driven company? So you're trying to like one day come to, uh, I'm guessing. So you're trying to develop a technology that one day that um, could be worth a lot, but it's kind of binary outcome. Is it like you know either develop technology or you don't? Well, I think we I think we develop technology in order to develop products. 10, 15 years, uh, or let's say 20, 20 years to be conservative, uh, we want to to have a product out there that gets cancer deaths in the U.S. down to less than ten thousand a year. Wow. So like um, 10 year, 10 to 20 year horizon is kind of a, your, your, what your um, development horizon is. And, and today you just ra you raised a bunch of funding? Uh, we raised uh, uh, 48 million to date. So that's, that's sort of now, now enough to, to get us to uh, transitioning to clinical stage, which is happening early next year. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, this is kind of one of those, those uh, uh, open master plan like, like, like things. Kind of unpack the three steps. How do, how do we get to cancer prevention? And how do we how do we build the company to to do that? So, um, the um, uh, we've talked about some of the core technologies we developed. Developed those the core technologies are valuable, and and uh, so we can generate some early revenue uh, through through licensing those technologies to others. Um, as we then start uh, developing actual cancer vaccines and other mRNA therapeutics, uh, we actually don't necessarily have to take them 
uh, all the way in the clinical development process. Uh, but uh, you know, once we get to phase one, phase two, um, we can license and partner them. And, and, and then they are sort of much higher value. Those are much higher value deals uh, than uh, technology licensing deals. Uh, and that then lets us bootstrap to a full stack bi biopharma company where we can run a, a very large, like, like you know, five year, uh, 40,000 patient cancer prevention trial. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, that then, then, then I think things become really, really interesting. So, so it is, it is definitely a long-term, long-term game. Uh, but in terms of the impact, I think the timelines are actually pretty short. Sounds good. And so the game is basically in the short term, like develop like patents and, and like, you know, technology so you can license it out, which gives you the revenue you need. And products. To get to and yeah, products. And product. Yeah, yeah, and products. And um, uh, how big is the team? Um, so we're, we're uh, 20 full-time people, um, 20, 20 researchers, and then then we have uh, various support support um uh organizations where we let's come up to about like um uh, 13 fdes uh all together uh primarily around like chemistry and, and manufacturing and you have a lab or some kind of like facil physical facility or no we have twenty thousand square foot uh lab space in seaport in in boston very cool i know the area well i don't know how uh how much like it's exactly relevant to you but i'm interested in your take on it uh yeah, I think I and a lot of people are very excited about mRNA COVID vaccine, uh, but like it didn't feel like it, it kind of delivered on the promise of giving you kind of long-term immunity. I guess, is that just something about COVID? It just mutates too much and there was no That's vaccine right. that would do it or is well, it related to mRNA? Uh, no, it is definitely not a uh, not an mRNA property. It is really all about all about the the speed of uh, SARS-CoV-2 evolution, which um, like yeah, I could say say a lot about that. The the, the um, um, essentially the challenge is that you you have this virus that that um, is has has sort of the, the the part that it uses to enter our cells. Um, the, the spike protein is very uh, and, and and specifically like the the kind of tip of it, the so-called RBD receptor binding domain, uh, is very big and very flexible. So, so it, it, it can it, it, it can easily tolerate a lot of variability. Um, so it actually uh, mutates more more slowly than the flu, but more of the mutations are viable. Um, and uh, uh, a, a a sort of uh, bioinformatician scientist called Trevor Bedford has run the, run this analysis of um, like what is the effective rate of evolution of SARS-CoV-2 compared to flu uh, once you account for that, and it's actually four times faster than the flu. So, so, so it's, it's very fast. Um, and, and that, that is the challenge. Now, what sort of happened is that, uh, we developed this first generation of vaccines without really taking this into account. I mean, it was relatively predictable from, from the beginning, but obviously the picture became more clear over time. Um, and the stopgap measure we have is that mRNA vaccines are also quick to update, but we are, our update rate is still too slow. Like we are, we are prob probably like one major variant behind usually, usually. Uh, with the the updated updated vaccines, um, the but the the other direction which um, has not really been taken taken yet, and we have we have uh, done quite a bit of work on this, um, is um, actually trying to do a more highly multiplexed mRNA vaccine. So there's no reason why why the uh, the um, why the mRNA vaccine has to deliver only one version of the spike protein or 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 of the RBD and indeed like the the uh, booster modern the modern and Pfizer boosters last year were bivalent so they had two they had the original Wuhan Wuhan spike and then the uh, the, the the omicron spike but the um, but that number does but the number 2 is is uh, could be could be 20 or 40. Could you even guess guess what future variants might be? Again, like machine learning uh, is being used to, to try to predict uh, in regions where where immune escape might might happen. But actually, I mean, uh, th what, what's sort of showing up in preclinical experiments around these kinds of uh, highly multiplex vaccines, which are also done sort of in non-mRNA fashion, although I think that'll be non-scalable in practice. But um, if you show the immune system enough versions of, of the uh, uh, of the spike protein, it actually generates more broadly neutralizing neutralizing antibodies. Oh, that's cool! It's just like destroy everything that looks anything like this, or, or yeah, find find all the common patterns uh, in in these in, in in what you see, and then then go after that. We have the technology to solve this. Actually, we just don't seem to have the will. Uh, and there there is a there is a um, uh, sort of a government attempt uh, uh, or project called uh, Project Next Gen that uh, is trying to be sort of a 
um, Warp Speed sequel uh, that that is uh, providing some funding to. When you say the will is lacking, you you just mean like it's kind of gone back to the default state, which takes like ten to fifteen years to go through clinical trials and etc. Not necessarily, but it is kind of a dead zone uh, in terms of commercial investment. Yeah, I mean, uh, like not to be like anti-capitalist but like the current state of the vaccine is great for capitalism it's like every six months you need a new one like capitalism doesn't necessarily optimize towards like has one vaccine never come back that's right and, and the, the and the revenue numbers are really insane like like the the so pfizer pfizer and biotech i think have now taken more of the market share uh but even moderna is still making many billions a year from from uh the the, the COVID boosters but yeah the the we we do have the technology to make the last COVID vaccine uh, just a question of whether whether the funding ecosystem supports it. Maybe the the project next gen is is the best bet, but they they also need seem to be spreading their bets uh, across across many different different approaches. Maybe maybe too broadly actually in my in my view, but uh, uh, but at least at least some some attempts are being made. Um, but I think like like uh, long term, it, it is it is unfortunate that this is where we've landed because there are issues like long COVID that will end up having. I think a big, big in, impact on both individual happiness, productivity, and and long term, long term chronic health conditions. That um, is is feels like a bit of a ticking, ticking time bomb that that we might all see the realize the real impact of a few years down the line. We've ended up on a relatively non deadly uh, vaccine variant. I think if if it mutated to something more deadly, we might regret not investing in a more generalized kind of solution. Yeah, I think like the the obviously there there's now most of the the population has had vaccines or 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 exposure exposure that does help help a bit. The um uh, it it is still quite likely that we will see big evolutionary jumps like like we did with Omicron. Uh, that that is really really I think a matter matter of time. And the deadliness is is compl- is is complicated. It's a function of our, our immune response as well as the the, the viral viral evolution. But um, but I mean, we might might well see see uh, an Omicron like event where uh, you have like a very uh, sudden complete uh, breakthrough through through both vaccine and natural immune responses, and then then everyone gets it. And even if uh, you know the actual actual death rate uh, or hospitalization rate is not that high, that will still have like a massive impact on on the healthcare system, like Omicron did. Do you have a take on whether I guess SARS CoV two was bioengineered and or Maybe more broadly, like where is kind of bioengineered weapons like heading based on like where technology is today? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, uh, so I think um, it seems hard to to parse uh, the SARS-CoV-2 origin story at this point. There's just sort of too too much too too much fog around around uh, what happened. I, I mean, I do do think it's uh, it's certainly possible that there was some kind of lab escape. Whether whether that whether that was um, I mean, it's the striking that uh, the Wuhan Wuhan Institute of Virology is in Wuhan, uh, the the, the um, and, and was was engaged in in coronavirus virus research and lab escapes do happen and, and there 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 have been historical examples of uh, those those lab escapes uh, causing causing uh, outbreaks like like seventies uh, flu uh, flu flu outbreak from a, from a sort of a Soviet Soviet lab escape um, so. Uh, I don't know. I think I think probably in this specifically in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it's it's like 50-50. I uh, hard hard to hard 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 to say. Um, but uh, but but not certainly not excluded by by uh, anything anything we know. Or strongly strongly excluded in terms of in terms of bioweapons. I think that is that is um, that is a tricky question. I mean, we are are certainly uh, the, all all the sort of exponential things about uh, DNA synthesis and and uh, uh, and everything. Um, everything around that are definitely enabling uh, capabilities uh, that that uh, uh, with, with sort of small scale bad actors that are that are quite worrying. There there are some info hazards here that I don't even want to like like say say in a in a podcast on on what kinds of things are 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 now possible. But yeah, I, I think we will see we will see engineered pathogens for sure. And one thing I've read is that it just doesn't take that many people to do it, right? Yeah, with nuclear weapons, you need like thousands of people involved, but this is like a smallish set of people that can make it happen. No, exactly. It, it, it's like a decently decently equipped molecular biology lab, twenty people, and then then like maybe that or less, less actually, like like a, not not even not even that many probably. But I mean, you need some some baseline level of expertise. Uh, th- then one one concern I think people have expressed with. Um, um, some of the uh, uh, sort of uh, large language models now, like ChatGPT, is that they actually might 
to some extent democratize the expertise you 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 need to to generate some of the ideas. I think the actual practical lab work is still still challenging enough that there's there's a non-trivial barrier. But like um but it could be uh it could, yeah, it could be individual terrorist organizations. It could be small, bad actor, rogue states like like those those kinds of groups are are definitely now capable of generating quite 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 worrisome worrisome pathogens. The uh, and I think like one lesson also from from uh, from COVID, I think, is that um, the um, the pathogen doesn't necessarily even have to be lethal to disrupt. Like if, if it can, I think it can also be an economic weapon. Uh, it can like disrupt disrupt supply chains, like impact people's people's productivity and decision making. Because of course the challenge is that uh, when you when you deploy a bioweapon, uh, your own population typically is also vulnerable. Like, like I mean, think the theoretically, uh, theoretically, eventually we, we might be able to get get uh, into more targeted targeted bioweapons, but that's still still quite quite uh, technically challenging. But uh, the um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you wear an actor like like Russia who just wants to to create chaos and disruption, uh, then you don't necessarily have to to release a lethal lethal thing, uh, and um, and maybe you can surreptitiously vaccinate your own population in advance also. But uh, so so I, I think bioweapons might be the nukes nukes of together with with AI they might be the nukes of the twenty first century. Uh, and um, uh, and obviously very different different fundamentally in nature. So I did recently recently write a novel draft where um, the the scenario is that um, uh, not not necessarily that I that I believe that this will hundred percent happen, but like a, a possible scenario for the next couple of decades is that we see increasingly frequent waves of both zoonotic pandemics and and then then human made engineered engineered pathogens of of like increasingly bizarre uh, variety. Uh, where uh, when it when it gets to the point where to actually live a normal life, uh, the, the 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 countermeasure has to be uh, an mRNA wearable. So you actually have have a, a microfluidic chip that you wear uh, that is able to to get just digital information, synthesize an mRNA vaccine in situ, and then update your immune system in real time. So so there's like these continuous software patches for your immune system that are going to get rolled out rolled out continuously. Uh, and uh, and and then that sort of sort of obviously becomes also a useful delivery method for for uh, other therapeutics and vaccines. But if we want to really build um, uh, the global immune system, uh, and whether whether it's sort of that form factor, but but I, mean, I think we do need do need uh, to figure out how to get much better at defense. People often talk about um, how how um, um, you know bioweapons are asymmetric, and that the att attacker has an advantage. Uh, that is true to some extent, uh, but uh, we we also have a defender advantage in terms of our immune systems. I mean, our, our immune systems are pretty good at dealing dealing with new pathogens if if enhanced with with things like like mR, mRNA vaccines. So so we just need to get much better at the the deployment deployment and and uh, part of it. What other applications are there for mRNA that you think is going to you know gonna, how is it going to change society twenty years from now? You know, apart from the ones that you're working on, the cancer, the you know the the, the cultured meat. Um, what else do you think is going to change with mRNA? Oh boy, let me let me paint you let me paint you a uh, picture of of mRNA scale. Um, so kind of kind of uh, uh, not focusing necessarily on the details of the things we're working on. So uh, so a useful framework that uh, Nikolai and I have have conversed on is is to think to really think. Let's think about this uh, as a kind of uh, kind of a Carlson curve. Like like uh or, or or an exponential curve, and I'm actually calling it Eroshenko curve after Nikolai. So so what what is the what is the quantity that will grow exponentially? Um, let's say it's sort of the 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 amount of mRNA or or the sort of number of base pairs of genetic information that we can safely deliver into the body. So the size so so the size of the exogenome, if you like, uh, in terms of base pairs. So, um, so so let's imagine that sort of going up exponentially. Um, so right now we are sort of at the one kilobase scale of exogenome, roughly. So, so so we can we can take one protein, we can take one one thing like like the the spike protein, and we can turn that into mRNA and put it put it in, um, or or you know we can replace one enzyme or, or 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 something like that, one missing thing, or put in one new thing. I think things will look very interesting if we get to one megabase. So I think in ten years, and this is not necessarily like global deployment, but like what is, what is possible and what is what is in the clinic. Uh, so one million base pairs, base, base pairs equivalent of genetic information delivered as mRNA. So that 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 might look like is a pan virus vaccine, for example. 
So like let's let's uh, vaccine that that one shot immunity against all respiratory viruses or or like like uh, common colds everything. Um, it might look like a preventative cancer vaccine. So obviously something we are are working on directly, but like something that is broad broad enough to to cover all likely cancer mutations. So that's kind of the the mega base mega base scale. Twenty years after that, I think we get to gigabase scale. Um, that might look like um, taking uh, all the the receptors in uh, someone's immune cells um, and delivering those as mRNA. So like a synthetic immunome, like a complete immune profile of of someone. So that that then then I think gets you to to dealing with autoimmune diseases. Uh, that that there, there's sort of healthy aging phenotypes. That you Wait, could so could you take like a, a kind of, you know, mature adult's immune system and inject it into like a baby so they could be immune to every single thing that adult is? Yes. And not necessarily like like a specific mature adult, but like like a, what is the optimal what is the optimal immune process? Like every mature the maturest adult. Like like the <laughs> mature, or, or like a, like an AI synthesized version version of like what the perfect human immune system should look like. Wow. So that's the kind of scale where where we I think we can get to in, in 20 years. Okay, 30 years, we can get to one terabase, 100 billion, billion base pairs of genetic information. So, so then, then I think we, we also may, might, might move out of the realm of mRNA. But um, to, to give you an indication of what that scale means, that's like our entire microbiome. So human, human genome is three gigabases. Uh, the, the, the human microbiome is actually 100 gigabases. Um, so, so our microbiome has more genetic information that, than our sort of, sort of mammal, mammal, the mammalian part, part of us. Um, so, so at hundred, so at the terabase scale, we can get to a fully synthetic microbiome. So we could take the perfect microbiome and and, and duplicate that. Um, so, so then now now we have perfect meta metabolism, or, or we can metabolize things that we can't currently metabolize. If you want to like eat eat cellulose and digest cellulose, that becomes becomes possible. Um, again, like not 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 here saying like the regulatory frameworks will will support this. We're gonna be eating grass and trees. Yeah. Yeah, this, I mean this. Uh, this is like the um, idea to your next book here, Hanu. <laughs> this is uh, this is the sequel to the to the current one, obviously. So so the um, I mean I'll just keep going because there's a couple more steps. So now we are like what 20, 2040. Can we can we get wings now? I want wings. <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, I think wings are wings are possible. I mean it, w wings might be more. So 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 I think the more more practical. If you really want wings, uh, I would say yeah. the like like a, like a functional wings that you are, are controlled by your nervous system. Yeah, yeah. I want to fly. Um, I don't want them to just look right. Good. So, so I think the I think the the uh, the easier way to do that rather than just sort of actually grow them because I think like the issue there's, there's also like you would have to completely remake your skeleton etc to 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 be able to to biomechanically support that. But I think that the easier way to do that would be to to uh, have uh, like a synthetic prosthetic wings or perhaps like lab grown lab grown wings, and then we tolerize your body to it. I think one actually a huge application area we didn't talk about yet for, for mRNA vaccines is sort of the opposite of uh, generating an immune response against something. It's actually marking something as self. So, so that's a very rapidly developing area of like uh, using mRNA, mRNA sort, of, sort of, I guess you anti-vaccines essentially to, to like uh, um, reduce, your, reduce your, tune down your immune responses uh, uh, for autoimmune diseases. But uh, a very similar application is uh, telling your body not to reject something foreign. So that would so that would then enable you to to engraft like uh, uh, you know biomechanical wings or 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 some or, or a prosthetic or 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 you know like like a like a pig organ which is which is something that people are obviously also actively working working on now. Uh, but I think like the route to wings is through through like like uh, cyb cyborg wings where where there's an mRNA layer to help you not reject. Wait, uh, I want to go back to your 10, 20, 30 year thing. So what's what's like the 50 year 50 year thing if we just skip to the end? Uh, so so there's two more steps. One one is so 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 after after the synthetic microbiome, uh, so that was terabase scale, so like 20, 20, 40, 20, 50. Uh, then we get to to petabase scale. So 10 to the 15, 10 to the 15 bases of genetic information. So we we now know that uh, in the brain. Uh, there are, um, uh, you know, between 3,000 and 5,000 different cell types. There was a new sort of major study that just came out. Um, so, so the brain actually has has quite a lot of lot of diversity. So, so we we often think of the brain as just the connectome, like this 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 sort of neurons connected to each other. But each neuron is a is a very uh, complex machine, and and as we have now just learned, there's like three to five thousand different types of types of cells in the brain. 
So, um, so the brain state or, 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 or something like a memory is probably defined not just the connectome, uh, not the connect, just the connections between neurons, but also like the the state of the individual neurons uh, and and the distribution of different different cell types uh, in, in the brain. Uh, so at petabase scale, we we can clone that. So so we can then then you know uh, actually actually clone someone else's brain state at at a molecular level in your brain. So so then uh, you know may, maybe maybe you you can actually download literally download memories. Uh, or 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 really fully feel what it feels like to be to be someone else, uh, or or certainly certainly do very radical radical AI brain computer interfaces. Is is memory actually stored as a series of kind of cell shapes and proteins? We don't know. Okay, we just don't even. Know. Uh, uh, we, the the, the uh, there are some really striking observations that are are sort of coming out about how the brain stores information. Like one thing that really blew my mind, mind recently is that I, I've been talking about this idea of the exogen, exogenome, like a genetic material outside our body. Uh, in a way, viruses are sort of the natural exogenome. Like uh, we have, we have a, lo- a, lo- a lot of our genes are actually repurposed ancient viruses that, that have, have, have come from elsewhere. A really major one in the brain is called ARC1. Uh, and it's, it's basically uh, a virus that has become part of our own genome. Um, and um, it's still able to make um, uh, viral particles in the brain that package mRNA from neurons and transmit that, that mRNA to other neurons. Um, and we don't really know what it does, uh, but if it's knocked out in mice, those mice can't form new memories. Oh, interesting. So maybe memory is mRNA. Maybe, maybe it is. I mean, or, or or certainly certainly there there are sort of there there are more complex biological mechanisms than just like the connections between neurons that are that are reinforced. But um, my my point is that like uh, if we imagine sort of the, the amount of genetic material that we would need to to deliver to to duplicate these patterns, or the amount of genetic information, then I think petabase scale I think gets us to actually duplicating all those patterns patterns in the brain. What comes after peta pico? Is that what's after peta? Exa. Uh, the depending on how you count the um, uh, total genomic information on Earth is about an exabase. So uh, so so the, this this becomes a little harder to visualize. But like imagine imagine this is like now like a post human form form of of uh, of sort of Homo exabasis where where each individual has access to an entire planetary ecosystem's worth of genetic information at will. That's when you that's when you get your wings, you get multiple bodies, you 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 become an ecosystem essentially that uh, can sort of uh, morph morph uh, and adapt to different different en- environments uh, and yeah maybe exist on on the same kinds of timescales that uh, planetary ecosystems do. It feels hard to imagine that's fifty years away. That is not necessarily fifty years away, but uh, the the, the uh, certainly not the practical applications of it. But this is kind of the thing about exponentials, like like uh, they they hit you they hit you surprisingly quickly. And my and my my argument is that like the the that mRNA is an exponential technology. Uh, it is driven by uh, exactly the same forces that are driving other exponential technologies. Like like uh, it is directly driven by Moore's law. DNA synthesis uses the same uh, sort of uh, uh, lithography and microarray uh, printing technologies. Um, DNA sequencing is, is an exponential technology for the for the same reasons and the, the sort of amount of data uh, of genetic data available to us that can drive things like protein design is growing exponentially and then then we add the AI layer layer to that for for the design. Uh, I would be very surprised if like the the Eroshenko curve of like the size of size of uh, our, our, our uh, external genome is not an exponential. So at some point it'll 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 blow up. I, I think the the time scales, uh, whether whether it's a few decades off or even a century off, uh, doesn't doesn't matter that much uh, in the same way that that uh, is the case with uh, with AI. It sounds like you think it also impact longevity quite a bit. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think the the they are they are probably the most promising. Um, Approach to to radical longevity extension or health span extension is this idea of um, cellular rejuvenation or reprogramming. There are there are a number of companies working on that. Companies like Altus Labs, like a three billion three billion uh, uh, Jeff Bezos backed uh, new new effort. Uh, there's many many others. New Limit, uh, that's uh, Blake Byers and uh, Brian Armstrong, uh, kind of an earlier stage company. But the the common to these 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 efforts is the idea that if you if you use these same factors. That we use to to turn our normal cells into into stem, uh, stem cell like states, 
uh, but transiently, uh, just for a little while, that can actually rejuvenate our, our cells. And you know, mRNA is absolutely the perfect, perfect vehicle to accomplish that. So I think um, longevity is definitely, definitely in the cards. Yeah. Wow. I feel like we could we could talk forever, Hanu, but uh, this is super super interesting as it is. Uh, really appreciate you kind of taking the time and walking us through not just what your company is doing, but like a real science lesson in mRNA and the future. But Hanu is an amazing <laughs> book writer. Uh, yeah. He wrote The Quantum Thief and The Fractal Prince, which I didn't even realize that he wrote them until this conversation. But they're both great <laughs> books, and I can't wait to read them. Yeah, it's one coming up. I can tell why you're a great sci-fi writer. I mean, you have all these great ideas. You're able to connect the technology to like the applications really well and understand how the technology is going to evolve to change the applications. So that's really exciting. No, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I think like one 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 important thing about writing and reading reading science fiction is that um, it, it's sort of easy to to think uh, about the impact of technology in sort of abstract context, but um, if you if you actually sit down and try to imagine a world where people are using this technology every day and 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 uh, and actually touching it and feel feeling it and 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 uh, uh, interacting with it, you usually uh, and and you sort of vividly bring that that scenario to to life in, in your mind. Um, which I think best science fiction does really well, then you usually notice things about it that you would not otherwise, like, like uh, you, you actually actually uh, understand the human dimensions much better. Makes sense. That's why you, you write great books and make good companies. Uh, all right, we better wrap up. Thanks, Anu. Thank you so much. <laughs>